Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Denise Goldfarb. I am a member of IWF here in Chile, South America. And uh, I would like to thank you today very specially for joining in this session about an intergenerational conversation on race, convened by the International Women's Forum and also presented by Walmart. And I also work at Walmart as Chief People Officer, so I am very, very proud of joining here together, representing both IWF and also Walmart. Um, I, I want to share that um, as part of my job is my responsibility to design a culture of change and evolution. And, um, and on this, uh, in Walmart Chile, we're taking intentional steps to ensure that our values are inclusive, uh, respectful, and mindful of different generations, genders, ethnicities, abilities, backgrounds, and also socioeconomic conditions. Um, earlier, earlier this year, uh, also you may, you may have heard that Walmart and its foundation made a commitment to address systematic racism in the US and has dedicated $100 million to the creation of a racial equity center focused on education, health, finance, and criminal justice. This is one of the reasons why Walmart is sponsoring these sessions. And uh, at Walmart Chile, we have 45,000 associates and 10% of them are from different races and nationalities. So this is really a part of our culture and we really love diversity and we love inclusion. And one of our focuses is to advance women through concrete initiatives that promote gender equality and women's economic empowerment, multiculturalism and inclusion of people with disabilities and sexual diversity also. And around the world, we have nearly 8 billion people and uh, nearly 64% of all the people living in the world are uh, representatives from the millennial generation and also from Generation Z. And we must look to this large and diverse group of, for inspiration and also for future growth. These generations particularly care about organizations and institutions that treat people with dignity and respect. They also care about environment, uh, about mentorship, and also about companies that are genuine, transparent, and intentional about their actions and commitments in addressing systematic racism, social justice, gender equality, and of course, diversity. As IWF members, we are always looking for actionable steps that we can take to advance conversations around equity. And I hope that today's session will be one of many that will lead to true and impactful steps to end racism once and for all. And before we begin, let me say that we welcome your questions. You can find there's a, a button, ask a question. So if you push that button, you can um, write down any question that you have. And I promise we'll, we will get as many as we can. So all the questions are welcome. And um, now I want to uh, introduce our exciting uh, guests. I'm going to start with Cindy. Uh, and I also need to share that um, Jo is going to also meet uh, with us in some minutes. Uh, she's having some technical issues, but she will join um, very, very soon. And well, Cindy Benavides. Hi, Cindy. Thank you and welcome. Denise, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And, you know, a huge thank you to IWF for having me as way of background. I was introduced by to IWF uh, by Joanne at Walmart uh, about two years ago when you held your convening in Miami and completely fell in love with the organization and uh, won the number of speakers and impact that you're having across the country. And as I look at the chat box, I really am thrilled that there's so many leaders that are representing us worldwide. Es un placer poder estar con ustedes aquí hoy. And so know that I have been looking forward to this moment and I look forward to our conversation and dialogue. Thank you very much, Cindy. Bueno, muy bienvenida. Ambas somos latinas, así que un agrado estar hoy día acá contigo. Well, I want to share that Cindy is the Chief Executive Officer of the League of Latin American Citizens, known as LULAC, 
She immigrated to the US from Honduras and she is a proud millennial. And Cindy, maybe you can tell us about LULAC uh, and about what, uh, what do you do to help uh, build strong Latino communities? Absolutely. Thank you for that question, Denise and Joy. I'm so happy to see you as well. Uh, joining us, LULAC is the League of United Latin American Citizens. We are the oldest and largest national Latino civil rights organization in the country. We were established in 1929. So we are 91 years young, 91 years strong. And our mission is to advance the Latino community on multiple fronts, whether it's health or economic empowerment, political influence, education, civil rights, and also politics and power in voting. Um, I will tell you that our chief mission is to protect and defend the Latino community. And you know, to put it in context, and this is something, Denise, that we have to acknowledge, is that we have long ways to go to make sure that women are represented at all levels. And so in our 91-year organization, I am the first Latina to lead this organization in 90 years. Um, and also in context, I am the youngest millennial, as a millennial, uh, leading a uh, uh, I would say national legacy civil rights organization in the country. I am unfortunately or fortunately I'm millennial and so I bring in oftentimes uh, Denise the context and, and really what I see within our, our millennial generation and also younger generations and making sure to amplify and uplift those voices. That's great, uh, Cindy, to hear. And, and I know LULAC, uh, it's a uh, volunteer based and you have, uh, you're working in 37 states. Can, can you tell us some more about that? Sure. So LULAC is a grassroots organization. I always say that the heart or el corazón de LULAC is our volunteer members. These are individuals who live and work in over 41 states in the U.S., Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. And, you know, to put it in context, our members are volunteers. They wake up every day either to go to work, to go to school. Our youngest member is 12 years of age. Our oldest member just turned 100 in April. And uh, it's really reflective of the diversity of our Latino community, Denise. And, you know, what I would tell you is that, you know, we, we seek to go out of mission. You know, our hope is that one day LULAC will no longer be needed. But, you know, in, 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 in the year 2020, we are as relevant as we were in 1929 in terms of uplifting the issues that are impacting our growing Latino community in the U.S. Okay, right, Cindy. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. Um, and uh, I'm going to start with the questions and also we will wait to Joy and I will introduce her when she, she joined the, the panel. And Cindy, um, when it comes to conversations about race and ethnicity, what do you perceive as the biggest difference between your generation and maybe thinking about your parents' generation? It's the same approach or do you think it's a different mindset? What can, what can you tell us about that? Well, I would tell you, Denise, and again, I'm in my mid-30s, um, but I think when we talk about race, we have to be able to also understand our own biases. And I had the privilege to go to a historical Black college here in the U.S., um, and I will tell you that one of the first things that Professor Baker asked us in class was, who comes to your house and sits around your dinner table? And is it reflective of the communities that you live in in your country? And, you know, I was only in my 19s, early 20s when, you know, when I started thinking really about the intersection of race as a Latina, as an immigrant, I can tell you that race plays a very important role in my life. I immigrated from Honduras at the tender age of one. Um, and so, you know, certainly, you know, I understand also the complexity of immigration in the U.S., U.S. foreign policy. Um, but I, I will tell you that even the dynamics that I see in the conversations I have in my own home with my parents, Parents, it's very different. And part of it is that as a millennial, we're growing up in a society that's more diverse, um, in a society where we interact with individuals from many different races. Um, and, you know, something that is often missed, Denise, is that, 
Latino or Hispanic is an ethnicity. And within our ethnicity, we have multiple races. So you have Latinos who are black, you have Latinos um, who are of other races. And you know, one of the things that we're trying to amplify is the voices or, of our Afro-Latino community. Um, we also have many Latinos and Latinas actually intermarry uh, with other races are at the biggest rate than every than any other uh, segment in America. So I am a clear example of that. My children are both Latino and African American. And so they're living in both cultures. And you know, part of it, again, um, Denise, I think is the exposure that Generation Z and that the millennials have had and in interacting with other individuals from very, um, very similar values and different backgrounds. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hi, now we have Joy. Joy, welcome. How are you? Hi, can you hear me and see me okay? Yes, yes, Joy. We can Hi. we can hear you. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Well, Joy of Fadu is an associate brand marketing manager in the technology industry where she emphasizes inclusion. Uh, Joy is a member of Generation Z and also helps young professionals to build their careers. Hi, Joy, it's really wonderful to have you here today. And I know you inspire on and also offline communities. What can you tell us about this? Sure. Hola a todos. Estoy entusiasmada de estar aquí. I speak a little bit of Spanish, so I'm excited to be at this table. Great. Okay. To me, on and offline communities is about the intersection of where people are gathering. So as as a young person, I think I've always grown up online. I've grown up on mobile and desktop devices and creating these communities of strangers who are con um, So the offline portion of it is like, who are these people? Who are these strangers that perhaps I've met online for the first time um, that I'm now meeting offline and in real life? So as a marketing professional, for example, I'm always trying to bridge that gap. Like, how can we UF or me and fellow black students, how do we create those safe places and experiences online? Um, and then if we are meeting online for the first time, what are those conferences or trends or products or international touch points um, that the digital kind of world can foster to bring us together? Okay, great. Thank you very much. You know, I have two kids and uh, I have a 12 years old daughter, Julieta, and she is she loves all the social media. She's a fan of Charlie D'Amelio. She tells me about her all the day. So it's amazing how uh, the new generations connect in a different way. So, so thank you very much. So we will continue uh, our with you, uh, Cindy, for the moment. Um, and I have a lot of questions to you, uh, maybe to, to make a deep dive on, on what you have recently shared about your vision and about also the differences on the generations and uh, why this is a more diverse uh, world and also uh, between races and between between ethnicities we have um we have a, a new approach it's lovely that you have shared also about your family uh, and about the values that your family for sure have about the vision and the importance of uh, inclusion and i want also to ask you if you think this is a global phenomenon about having this new vision about race and ethnicity, or maybe you think it's maybe in the US or in some countries that have, uh, that understand the importance of, of, of having this in, in top of the, of the topics. Sure. No, thank you, Denise, for that question. And, and you know, I can only speak as an ally. I can speak as uh, an observer uh, in terms of what is occurring in America with the movement Black Lives Matter. And you know what is true is that America has always had a very interesting history and a, a race dynamic that has impacted who we are as a nation and as a country. And and I think Denise, you know, to put it in context, I really do think that this is the first time um, post uh, Civil War era in Reconstruction where we are seeing a very intentional and direct movement of our youth and uh, leaders really taking this head on. And the truth is that the race dynamics in America is not something that's going to go away um, because we see our growing communities of color 
whether African American, Latino, AAPI, Native American, Indigenous, growing. And to just give you the context of the Latino community, the Latino community today is about 18% of the total population or 60 million strong. And in just 30 years, 30 years, three decades, the Latino community will be 130 million strong or 30% of the total US population. And what that means is that one in three Americans will be of Latino ancestry. Um, and so certainly, you know, the issue of race relations is not going away. And, you know, part of my job, Denise, is making sure that we uplift the issues of Latinos. And, you know, one thing that I wanted to mention is that it's also, we live in many intersections, right? And when we think about race relations in America, we also look at this from a gender issue or gender equity issue, rather, as a Latina, um, I can tell you something that is very top of mind for me is income equality inequality and the fact that as a woman, as a Latina, I earn 53 cents to the dollar of what a Caucasian male would make doing the same exact job. And we know that this is not only true for Latinas, but for also African-American women, for Caucasian women, we earn less for doing the same exact job. And so this is where as women, we continue to persist even when our voices are shut down, we continue to persist. Even when we earn less doing the same job, we continue to persist. Even when politicians put policies in place that deny our very own existence. And, and Denise, I, I bring that up because I think it's so important that we highlight the fact that so many of us live at intersections of, of our different lives. And in our own countries, what we saw worldwide with the movement of Black Lives Matter is that so many of the communities of color living in those countries who have their own unique histories also said enough. You know, we want to be heard. We want to be visible. And, you know, I, I do, you know, I do think very thoughtfully about our own rights as human beings being respected, you know, having uh, dignity, uh, making sure that we are being valued for who we are with all of our commonalities and all of our differences. And so I, I would say, Denise, that as we look at race relations, particularly in America, America has always been a beacon of hope. Um, we have gone through some really interesting years these past four years, and certainly I, I think that the future is bright because uncovering or peeling off that Band-Aid has, you know, will enable us to, to heal, right? We have a lot of healing to do and also shifting of narratives of who Latinos, of who immigrants, of who our African-American community is. Oh, thank you really, Cindy, about that. Um, you know, I, I was thinking that um, in America, regarding North America, Central America, and South America, we're a new continent. So this is a land of immigrants. So. Uh, I think this is very, very important to recognize. And it, it was amazing also the, 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 um, the data that you're sharing about being uh, the Latin community, 18% now, and in 30 more years, 30% of all uh, the people in America. And, and about that, I, I want to, um, to ask you about um, what do you think about the Latino community? Because the US election uh, highlighted that the Latino community is not monolithic. It's much more diverse and it's not one big thing, but the same thing. So it is important for non-Latinos everywhere to recognize this diversity and not overgeneralize. You know, Denise, that is such a great question. And, you know, for those tuning in, you know, please don't dislike me for saying that I've been in politics for a long, long time. And by long time, I mean over 15 years. And I, you know, I, my, my very first job was actually campaigning statewide in Virginia for then Lieutenant Governor Tim Kaine, who went on to become Governor Tim Kaine and now is a standing U.S. Senator for the Commonwealth. Um, but what I will tell you is that even back in 2003, this is over 17 years ago, I was trying to make the point of making sure that our candidates and our political party understood that the Latino community is not monolithic. The truth is that, you know, we are from very different religions. We are from different nationalities. We are also from different generations. Um, you know, where you live matters. So if you live in Nuevo Mexico or New Mexico, you know, there's a very uniqueness to our, 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 our state 
in Nuevo Mexico versus Texas versus Florida versus Ohio versus Washington State. And so there's a richness and diversity and you can't target us with one single message because we are not monolithic and it will not resonate. And so this is where I think the learning lesson and takeaway from the 2020 elections is one, you have to invest early. You know, you can't come in at the last minute invest and then expect us to turn around and support you within hours right we want to date for a certain period of time before we actually accept the proposal and get married and so you know for us it's really sending that strong message that we want to see this long-term sustainable investment from all political parties because the truth of, of the truth of the matter is Denise that what makes uh, America so beautiful is the diversity and thought and opinion and even having strong political parties that represent those diversities and thoughts and values is very important and you know what I would also say uh, is the role that social media plays right the fact that we saw Latinas women turning at record numbers really taking a strong stance in terms of what they want to see in their elected officials and also mentally the things that, that we're not only just voting, we are running for office, right? We are making sure that we are sitting at that table, uh, bringing up the policies that impact ourselves and our families and our communities. And I think that's also very important to point out because, you know, we're living at a time when representation matters. And I, you know, I will tell you that oftentimes we use a lot of different hashtags. And one of the hashtags is we can't be what we can't can't see. And so I know that very soon America will have a woman president. Um, the date is coming. And so that will be a day of rejoice. Uh, I know that so many of us will celebrate finally being able to see a woman uh, seated at the White House. And for the time being, we have our vice president-elect, Harris, uh, who represents a wonderful community across the country. So we're so excited to be able to see movement and shifts happening in America in 2020. Oh, that, that's great. Uh, I agree with you having Kamala Harris. I think that uh, it's very near the day that um, there will be a, a women president in the White House. Uh, in Chile, we have had uh, twice a women president. And I think that the countries learn a lot uh, about having um, a, a women leadership. And that's great. And also, I was thinking, um, uh, Cindy, about unconscious bias. Uh, I think this applies not only for the Latino community in the US, I think that maybe in the rest of the world, all the Latinos are, are, are seen like the same culture. Uh, and we don't uh, we don't eat tacos in Chile, maybe. And we have different backgrounds, different cultures and different uh, practices also. So I think this is very important to recognize from the Latino community and also from Africa. Africa also is very, very diverse and very rich about different cultures. And I think this is part of having um, a, a broader view about globalization and understanding also why it's so important to have oh, to address these differences and how innovation in this digital era is so important to have these different visions, different backgrounds and different uh, cultures. So that's really very important. Hi Joy, how are you? Now we see you very, very well. Can you hear us? You're in mute, I think. There. Hey there, Hi. I'm here. So sorry. I've had a, a variety of audiovisual issues, but I'm excited to be joining this conversation. No, thank you very, very much, Joy. You, you just entered in the right moment. I want to make a question for you. Um, and it's, uh, Joy, you, you work for a social media company in the technology industry. Could you help us understanding the role of social media in the lives of millennials and members of the Generation Z? and how it is being used to elevate marginalized voices. Absolutely. I think that the main way that it's being used is that for the first time, young people are being given an opportunity to broadcast themselves like internationally. So the idea that anywhere that you are, whether you're in your basement in Minnesota or in a village in Japan, you can advocate for the causes that you care about by creating a social profile, by rallying your friends, using digital products to fundraise. Like that is a huge opportunity. I think 
back to the 60s in America, where if you wanted to rally around something, perhaps you had to join like, you know, a school organization or a community organization, be in the basement, right, cheering, cheering people on and then take to the streets or take to a shop like this can all be done now from someone's closet, from someone's bedroom, from someone's home. So I think that it's it's an incredible opportunity to kind of be bigger than yourself um, that a lot of my generation takes advantage of. We're all very cause conscious. So there's no more um, you know vanity social media profiles. I think we're all excited to advocate for causes that we care about and it becomes like a, a social demand. If you haven't posted about Black Lives Matter, if you haven't posted about the Indian worker strikes, if you haven't posted about natural disasters, you're seen as almost someone who is like out of touch. And so we pride ourselves on being very socially connected and, and setting up those profiles. Thanks, Dion. I don't know if folks have started asking questions. I can certainly take a look and see if I can answer some of them. Um, so there's one that's addressed to Joy and myself in terms of sharing our experience and encountering racial challenges in the workplace or finding work. And Denise, I, I think you're back on, correct? I, I was getting ready to tackle the Q&As in the chat box. Okay, great. Um, have you read already the first question? I was um, addressing the one in terms of encountering racial challenges in the workplace. And I would say that, you know, certainly I, I have encountered that. But I think what has been very significant in my life, um, and this is reverse ageism, is that for being young, oftentimes my voice was excluded or not taken into account. And so to give you just a general idea, my very first um, high level position was at the age of 23 when I became a cabinet member for Governor Kane in Virginia. And I remember that because I was so young, oftentimes, you know, people would say, well, what experience do you have? And the truth is that I bring a lot of experience, one, living and working in the Latino community in the state. And so I learned very early on to work with the governor and the general counsel and understood that sometimes, you know, unfortunately I needed that a validator, right? And this is, you know, again, more than decades ago uh, to make sure that folks understood uh, the urgency and the question or why I was making a certain comment. Um, and so, you know, it took effort and time, Denise. I had to have a meeting before the meeting, before the meeting to make sure to line everything up so that as I was speaking or bringing forth an idea that I already had people in the the room that would validate what I was saying. And it's unfortunate, right, that ageism does exist and it, it happens in both directions. Um, I would tell you as a Latina um, and as an immigrant, there are times English is my second language and sometimes um, my accent will kick in and I don't know if I'm speaking French, English or Spanish or a combination of all three, um, which means it's not, not a known language. But, you know, oftentimes, you know, folks would ask me in clear English to please repeat myself with a higher pitch tone. Um, and so I would have to just take a step back and make sure that I was clearly verbalizing what I was saying um, so that they were able to understand. But also, you know, as, as someone who was brought to this country at the age of one, I consider America to be my home. Honduras is the place of my birth and where my parents and my ancestry um, is tied to. And even farther than that is Spain and then Morocco. Um, and so I would say, um, Denise, that I certainly have experience and I think my very first experience encountering um, racism is was when I was working in the governor's office. We were in a public space getting lunch and I always made a point to wear a business suit because I was so young. And I remember a gentleman came up to me and said, um, you know, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm Latina. And he didn't know the term, so I said Hispanic. And then he turned to me and said, I've never seen your kind in business suit. And so, and this is, you know, I'm talking about 15 years ago, right? This is not, you know, 1950, this is not 1980s, this is just 15 years ago. And so, Denise, I would say absolutely, I've encountered it at different levels. Oftentimes what I also see is that I'm typically the only Latina in the room, as well as sometimes the only woman, as well as the only immigrant. Um, and so it's really interesting that we're still going through these dynamics uh, here in America. Thank you very much, Cindy. And I would like also to ask Joy about this question. Uh, Joy, it's about if you can share your own experience um, 
of having encountered racial challenges in the workplace or finding work. I know you also started um, working at a young age, uh, at the same as Cindy. So maybe what was your experience and did you think some unconscious bias or, or challenges in the workplace? Sure, sure. I think that the, the main challenge is being one of few or maybe the only one. So that's something that I've encountered as well. Um, you bear the burden in that case of being a representative for your entire race, um, which is not an ideal experience. You know, it, it doesn't foster being comfortable in the workplace when you feel that, oh my goodness, they are judging the actions of all Latinx people, all black people, all Nigerian people based on how I show up at work. So whether it was my internships, um, working in education, marketing, entertainment, it was often just me in Hollywood when I was a red carpet photographer, I was jockeying with older white men and they were like, who is this person? Like, why is she here? So your credibility is automatically questioned. It's very nerve wracking. It's a lot of pressure, I think, to be um, on top of the job. And that hasn't changed, I think, like across generations, which is unfortunate. One thing that has changed, though, is I think that now there's a lot of energy around creating inclusive workplaces. So if the employer, you know, doesn't have that diverse workforce, at the very least, they want to empower their underrepresented employees to step up and, and create that community. So I've been fortunate to work at some larger companies where, you know, we're able to gather as black women, black people, as Nigerians um, and kind of share that. And that's when those microaggressions that we experience or even macroaggressions we have a commonality and a thread to say, hey, did this happen to you? I'm experiencing this, I'm struggling with this. And it makes you feel a bit more sane. I think my generation now also though is demanding that, you know, we're we're not as, as passive. Um, I think in some cases, because it's not as much of a touchy topic or sensitive subject, it's like, no, if I experience a microaggression at work, I'm gonna write a post that the entire company is going to read. And that's a big change, you know? So we, we demand to be in spaces where we are seen and heard and valued and I think that, you know, despite our personality traits, some people might be more extroverted about it or introverted about it. That's something that we need in a workplace. We're really looking for an employer that values us and creates that safe space for us. Great. Thank you. You, you know that uh, hearing you and uh, the approach that, that this new generation has to these topics, it's really um, very um, inspirational uh, about this not more a taboo, uh, we are really open to share our experiences and understand, and also to give visibility on maybe um, a, 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 a kind of treatment that's not uh, really fair. Uh, I think that's really a, a strong difference between the, the new generations that are able to, to open, to have these conversations. And, and really, this is the, the, the kind of practice that are going to, to make things change, finally. So it's really amazing. Um, we have also a, another uh, interesting question from uh, Dina Staudacher. Uh, it's uh, if you can speak to intersectionality, uh, it's, it's how to understand the importance of this term and how to use it properly when discussing with peers, intersectionality. Careful. Joy, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll touch on it briefly. Um, I was lucky to have my communication education from USC Annenberg. So it's something that we touched on when unpacking what is race, what is ethnicity, and what is intersectionality. Um, to me, it's studying how the different identities that I have or that we as humans have um, that intersect and advocating from that place and protesting from that place and educating from that place. There are issues in the black community that are unique to black women. For example, misogynoir, right? That are not uh, applicable to black men. And so to say that all people of color or all black people, you know, have one experience, especially here in the United States, um, is just untrue. So we need to kind of bring those things together. I also have other identities. I am cisgendered, I am heterosexual, um, I'm Christian. These are very sort of normative identities in, in the United States um, that make it kind of easy, right? I'm able-bodied. These are things that make it easy for me to navigate the world or the workplace. I'm educated, but that there are aspects of you know me being black and me being female that put me at a disadvantage. So it's really considering how those things intersect and um, how they give me privilege in some cases, right? Um, and how I am oppressed or marginalized in other spaces because of the intersection of those identities. Right, and I, I would just you know add on that um, you know as we look at intersectionality, you know as Joy mentioned, we wear so many different hats. 
And, you know, what I would say when I look at the corporate world, and, and I see this happening also sometimes in government, is that we segment of our communities, whether it's into the different, you know, African American, Latino, API, veterans, disability, LGBTQI. And, you know, at some point, we have to make sure that all of these groups are connecting because there are absolutely unique experiences, but there's also issues that impact all of these groups similarly. And so finding that commonality is very important. And oftentimes I don't see, for example, some of the corporations making sure that they are convening once a month or once a quarter, all the different groups together to have a joint conversation of what is occurring within the groups is very important. But I would also say, uh, Denise, that, you know, oftentimes folks don't understand our various communities, and we are complex, right? When you look at the Latino community in America, you know, not only do we have a segment that is immigrants, but we also have a segment, and I'm thinking of our Southwest, um, you know, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, Washington State, California, where the border crossed them, they never crossed the border. And with the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty, you know, what occurred is that the Mexican community was allowed to stay there, become full, full, have like the full rights of US citizens retain their land. However, that is not what occurred after that treaty, right? And many of our communities were displaced. And then we forget again that within the Latino community, you have indigenous um, communities that exist within the Latino community. You also have Afro Latinos. And, you know, I think it's so important, again, that we understand these complexities. It, you know, I will tell you that even for me, Denise, I have to continuously have these dialogues, conversations, read, connect with academia, connect with our community to understand really what is happening. But I, what I do want to point out, and I think it's very important, in, on the subject of unconscious bias, is that privilege is blind. And that is something that oftentimes we do not address, and that is universal, right? Regardless of what country you live in, privilege can be blind. And I think if we are able to take a step back and understand one, what are our privileges? And I can tell you one of them for me is that I happen to be a light-skinned, fair-skinned Latina. And, you know, that is not the case for all my Latina uh, sisters, hermanas. Um, but I would also say that I think, you know, we need to also see how are we oppressed whether it's outside of the home or whether it's inside the home, whether it's because of traditional cultural structures, and also understand that we have to take time to unlearn what we have learned. And you know, part of what I'm finding is that a lot of the books that I read that I grew up with, that I had that were taught to me in high school, were not written from a Latino narrative. In fact, the Latino history in America is excluded from history books. And so now, you know, I'm on this uh, really long term sustainable impact to make sure that Latinos are more represented, that we have more Latino writers, that our, our voices are heard and visible and that we are narrating from our own experiences what our experience has been in America. No, oh, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cindy. Um, I have another question for you both. Um, it's from uh, John Pavelidia Murphy from Walmart. Um, how do we help millennials and Generation Z to join these women advocacy organizations? I would say, I would jump in here, Joy, and I would say, I think there's in several ways, right? Like for one, you know, I, I want us to also understand where so many of us were when we were in our 20s and maybe early 30s. And I will tell you, as someone in my 30s um, who is a, a mother of a three and five year old, I oftentimes think of, you know, where we are and the different segments of our lives, right? And so as I think of our younger generation, you know, when so many of them are starting their careers, they're looking for jobs, they're looking for sponsorships or mentorships. I think one of the greatest things that we can do is if you're in a work setting sponsor, uh, one or two or how many ever you can of individuals who are starting in their careers, because it's really hard to understand culture, right? There's also something called code switching. And I do it all the time as a Latina, where in certain settings, I know that I have to, you know, speak um, in a very uh, different way. And in some settings, I'm able to go in between Spanglish or English and Spanish, 
or just Spanish um, or sometimes French. Um, but, you know, like I think it's important that we also understand, you know, our role as individuals. And, and I will tell you that oftentimes taking these actions takes courage. And I want us to always choose courage and understand that, you know, where were we in our 20s, right? And what did we ourselves need? And why don't we connect with individuals, whether it's in the workplace or outside, and have an honest conversation with them. And I will tell you that, you know, mentorship is two ways, right? Like I will tell you that as a mentor, I learn and and, and walk away feeling so privileged. Um, but more than that, understanding that I have a bigger role to play as an individual in society. I think that's a great point and also about empowering us to lead. Like though we are young, the things that I've seen people under the age of 21 accomplish already um, is incredible. We have Tiana locally in San Ramon who led um, a Golden Gate Bridge protest for Black Lives Matter that thousands of people attended. Maya the environmentalist, Polly Irungu who started Black Women Photographers and started curating this national network of, of female photographers, you know, being a young member of my generation. Like these are things that I think previously maybe we didn't have the tools to do or businesses have been set up in a way that is so traditional and so hierarchical that we have to prove ourselves before we're being given that opportunity to lead. Um, but now as someone who's led global campaigns alongside folks who have 15, 20, like almost 30 years experience, I'm like, I know that I can do it, right? I know that my peers can do it. So giving us you know, the opportunity to really lead, to spotlight us and, and empower our voices, I think is one of the best things that you can do for young women. Thank you very much. I have a question for you, um, Cindy. Um, it's uh, regarding LULAC. Uh, what's your vision about LULAC in the future? This is a question from Lisbeth McNabb. Gosh, thank you for that question. And I will tell you that LULAC, again, is 91 years young, 91 years strong, and we are governed by a constitution. And so LULAC um, is led by our members. And I, I will tell you that I, I think that God or a higher being works in a really interesting and fascinating ways. And I started my career in organizing. And so coming into a grassroots organization, I will tell you that what makes LULAC LULAC what is the heart of LULAC, el corazón, el alma uh, of, of LULAC is our members. And our members who live and work in their respective communities dictate to me what should be the priority issues. And I would have it no other way. And so I will tell you that as we look to the vision and future of LULAC, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is the issue of representation. We actually have a national campaign to make sure that more Latinos and Latinas are represented on corporate boards. And I just wanna give you an example. In California, we had State Bill 826 happen, which mandated that corporations headquartered in California add women. And in a state where Latinos are close to 40% of the population today, of 511 seats that opened up, only 17 seats went to Latinas. And this just occurred, right? Like this is something that is happening now. So that tells you, you know, how much work we have to do to make sure that there's more Latinos represented. I will tell you that the issue of immigration, again, is something that's very close to my heart. And here in America, we currently have children as young as a few months old and as old as 17 years of age who are in detention centers who have been separated from their families. There's over 600 plus children who at this moment, the US federal government does not know how to connect them with their parent. And this was under a zero tolerance policy under President Trump. Um, I will tell you that the issue of connectivity, uh, technology and broadband is so important. And I say that in the context of COVID-19, we could not be gathering here today were it not for Wi-Fi and broadband. And we saw joy firsthand that we experienced this directly. But I will tell you that in the context of the Latino community, one in three Latinos in America do not have access to technology or broadband. And I just want you to think about our children, right? Like so many of our community is young. How many children are being left behind? We already have data that there's a 400% increase in middle school and Latino high school students who are flunking. They're getting Fs um, because they're not able to 
learn online or because they may just not have access or because they live in a household where there's only one laptop and you have three children who are trying to go to school at the same time. So these are major points and needs that we're arguing. Obviously the issue of civil rights is an issue that we will continue to work on. This is really the core of who we are. We are advocates. Um, and I would say that you know part of, of, of my goal as we look towards the future is to one day be non-existent. You know, I, I hope that one day LULAC does not exist, uh, where we have our community who is not being targeted, like we saw in El Paso, where our ethnicity was used as a weapon against us. And this was probably the big, biggest shooting that we saw in the Latino community, targeting our community because of our ethnicity. Um, and so, Denise, what I would say, absolutely, as I look towards the future, I work hand in hand with our LULACers, our LULAC familia, uh, who dictate part of that future and and part of my role is to make sure that we execute. Thanks. Uh, I have a great question, and this question is for Joy. Uh, it's about uh, a di disagreement. So I, I love this to, to have a great discussion. And I want to thank uh, Mia Suokonaufio from uh, Toronto. And uh, her comment is on the, the following. Frankly, I find social media streams exhausting and often more demoralizing. Even though I know that social media is a hugely powerful organizing tool, I confess I am most often tempted to disengage. What are your thoughts on how to use social media in ways that advance diverse women uh, versus virtual signaling, chattering classes, or polarized debates where no one is listening? So how we can have a good use of social media and really have engagement through through this channel, Joy? That's, the that's, a, that's a great question, Mia. Um, thank you for that. I think in the same way that I would advise you to shave or to cut your hair, go with the grain, not against the grain. Like, it is not natural. It is not in our, our human beings and human systems. We don't have an inclination to be staring at a screen all day, to be arguing with people all day, do what's natural um, for you. And I think that that is how social media becomes a tool that we can use rather than platforms or, or constraints, right? That we feel bound to. I think there are a lot of unspoken rules of social media that make it very exhausting, um, notwithstanding some of the algorithms you mentioned or, or the polarization. Having a robust education about the way that various social platforms works, I think can make you less exhausted, right? Just like when you're in school or the workplace, if you start to learn the lay of the land, um, after a while, you are not as exhausted by some of its downsides. And I think knowing that when you are expressing or participating, especially in political discussions, race related discussions, the algorithms are built in a way, right, to get you to see what you like and what you agree with um, and to have long drawn out debates with pinned comments um, about things that, that you disagree with. Trolls will come, anonymous people will attack. It's just the lay of the land. So once you know that, um, I think utilizing some safety and security features to the best of your ability, especially as an organizer, taking advantage of all muting, blocking, unfollowing features is very important. We are not obligated to follow anyone back. We are not obligated to respond to every comment and every conversation. Just like if you were walking on the street and someone yelled something untoward at you, you're not obligated to respond. So I wouldn't do the same thing when you're on social, um, especially as an organizer. Focusing our resources, I think um, Van Jones said this a while ago, if only we poured as much energy into the things that we loved and the things that we cared about, right, rather than the things that we hate. So that's how I try to navigate social. and That's how I make it less exhausting for me. Um, I try to have dedicated time where I'm on social. Inevitably, I'm social media addicted as per my generation. So I'm on it almost all the time. So that's why it's very important for me to have these boundaries. I will not argue with anyone on the topic of race. It is not my responsibility as a black woman to educate anyone, any stranger on the internet on the topic of race. I will respond to well-meaning close friends who ask intelligent questions that cannot be answered by Google. But that is the limit of what I'm able to do in a global pandemic, and that's okay. So setting up those boundaries, I think, will really help you navigate social in a way that's healthy and less exhausting. Oh, great, great advice, Joy. Thank you very much. And I had the last question. I think that um, we can, we can, uh, have this hour three. Uh, this is what are a couple of things that you or your organization have done to facilitate inclusion and enable you to bring your authentic self to work? So yeah, I, I, 
Oh, go enjoy, enjoy. Sure, I'll touch on it shortly. Um, for me, I think within my personal brand, I've recognized and realized how much standing in my own identity and truth as a first generation woman, Nigerian immigrant, um, you know, black woman, like how much that has helped me actually in professional and social spaces. So I try to encourage others to do that. I founded Find Joy in Your Journey, um, which is an online course that I launched for young professionals around the Gen Z millennial, but everyone's really welcome. Um, to learn how to tie together those personal branding elements as well as your identity. This is something that I think we should really carry forward and trudge forward with when we're applying to jobs, not something to hide. How to weave race and how to weave your cultural interest, that intersectionality into your story when you apply is what I think will help us advance in the workplace. So I've encouraged people, especially who come from collectivist cultures, because I think you know, this is an international conversation. It's very easy to sit in the United States and say, everyone wear your race on your sleeve and advocate for it, demand what you want, because that's what my culture rewards. But for others who don't come from that culture, um, I'm really focused on speaking to young girls, students and women about how they can do that in a way that will help them promote advance and create virtual visibility. So that's been a major thing. I think also the global campaigns that I've led have really been targeted at the black community. So I'm not afraid to go to, you know, superior supervisors, et cetera, and advocate for budget that is specifically targeted at creating media that will appeal to a black audience. I think we have to use those words explicitly, not say, I'd like to do something for people of color, but to say explicitly, this is how the black community affects the bottom line of our business. And this is how I'm going to set up a campaign um, that will not only feed them, but then feed us as a company. So those are things that I've done and how my initiatives have been focused. I've sponsored music festivals, community parades, nonprofits, flown kids across the country to have very unique experiences that they wouldn't otherwise. And that's personally how I advocate. Thanks, Joy. Cindy? Thank you for that question, Denise. And, you know, I, I would say that all of us are the CEOs of our brand and all of us lead who we are. And, you know, I, I lead in multiple ways, but I, I will tell you that as the CEO of LULAC, the, one of the very first actions was making sure that there was pay equity within my own team. And so making sure that, you know, regardless of gender, uh, that we were paying our, 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 our employees really equitable wages and also making sure that you know because of being a woman or because of being younger that they weren't being underpaid so that was the first action of order the second one and, and i would mention this is that my executive team is latina it's all female it's we have a diversity in terms of african-american latina lgbtq different age ranges um and so that is also very important for me and i think you know also having an open door policy right I want to make sure that as I lead a national Latino civil rights organization, that we have different voices that say we can do this better or have we thought about this approach? And I think we have to be all open to the dialogue and conversation that will ensue. Um, I will also tell you that at the peak of Black Lives Matter, I brought in our allied organizations, the National Action Network with Ebony Riley to come and talk to my national board and make sure that we understood how can we be better allies? How can we be better partners? How can we make sure that we are taking a step back so that the voices of our African-American Black brothers and sisters is amplified? And I would also say, Denise, that we can all do this, right? And it's when we walk into a room, we can be vocal about who is missing in that room. And oftentimes who is missing in the room is our Native American community. Who is missing in the room is our youth and our young leaders. And so we have to be able to make sure that we are able to raise our hand, raise our voices and bring that to light right? It can be uncomfortable. Don't get me wrong, right? These conversations can be uncomfortable, but I think if we don't address them, then that issue is invisible. That issue does not exist. And this is where all of us as leaders globally, right, in our respective countries can take that action. And then I would just end it, Denise, that, you know, I live by this philosophy, philosophy that all of us every single day wake up and every action that we take, we're either walking towards love or we're walking towards fear. And I want to make sure that we choose love, right? Even if it can be uncomfortable, even if it questions or makes us question our own value system, what we've learned, what we have not learned, I want to make sure that we also really center ourselves and are intentionally living in what we believe um, at home and at work. Thanks, Cindy. 
I want to add that uh, at Walmart, we also have uh, DNI practices, and I think they are mostly about um, communication and leadership. And in communication, it's how diversity and inclusion is the main part of our associate value proposition. And it's part of uh, how we attract talent about the pictures that we choose from our associates from different colors, ages, uh, and we really uh, are passionate about these differences and about the di this diversity. And also how we encourage our leaders uh, with, um, with trainings on unconscious bias to be very open. Also, as you said, um, Cindy, this uh, open, pol open door policy. So to be um, consistent uh, in the culture of diversity and inclusion, it's about communication, but also keeping uh, this safe space in the workplace. So I really, really appreciate it. Well, we are in the hour, so it's uh, already an hour and a half to really uh, fly away. And Cindy, I enjoy. Um, I really want to thank you all for this insightful and important conversation. Uh, I believe we help a great understanding and hopefully, um, hopefully help bridge differences. Uh, and thank you also, Joy. I, I saw in the chat that you shared some of your uh, social social media contacts, so it's great to to follow you. I love your posts, uh, Joy. I have to say, I, I like your very funny and very inspirational. So I am a great follower <laughs> of you. And thanks to uh, thanks to all the IWF uh, community uh, for watching and for your wonderful questions. This was uh, very interactive, so I, I really love that. Um, this is why this is very meaningful to each one of you that have been uh, participating. And please keep an eye on your info inbox uh, for announcements about upcoming uh, IWF virtual events. Um, we're going to let you know if we're going to record this session and make it available uh, for the future. And thank you again also to Walmart for sponsoring this important conversation. And take care. Bye. Have a great day. Gracias. Thank you. Bye, Cindy. Chao. Que tengan buen día. Bye, Denise. Bye, Bye Joy. Que tengas un placer. Bye, Joy. Beso.